Okay. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Brendan Peter, and I have the uh, privilege to lead CA's Global Government Relations Team. Um, this panel discussion this afternoon is going to be different than a lot of the content that we've been presenting throughout the week here at CA, which has obviously been pretty technically focused, pretty product focused. What we're going to talk about today is some regulatory and legislative developments that are impacting behavior in the marketplace around data security and cybersecurity as well. And so um, we're intending to have a, a collaborative discussion with my two co-panelists. Let me introduce them very briefly so you know who's here. Uh, to my immediate left is Adam Sedgwick, who is a uh, senior uh, 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 official at the National Institutes of Standards and Technology in Washington and DC and um, Adam has had a long background in cybersecurity policy in particular in Washington. Um, he is the lead person at NIST that was responsible for shepherding the process through to develop the NIST cybersecurity framework and I should stop and ask see if folks in the room are, are, are uh, aware of the NIST framework before we jump too much into these conversations? Okay, good, a lot of shaking heads, that's great. So Adam led that process um, and prior to that also was on Capitol Hill uh, with the Senate committee that spent years trying to pass comprehensive cybersecurity legislation. So he's got a great background and experience that's gonna be helpful for us as we talk through these issues. Immediately to his left is Andrea Glorioso, who is with uh, the European Commission. He is stationed in Washington, D.C. as well, and his portfolio is digital issues. Uh, before uh, Andrea came to the U.S., he spent uh, eight or nine years in Brussels working for the European Commission on cyber, data privacy, and a range of other issues as well. And uh, his role is really important because a lot of what we want to focus on today is also some cyber and data privacy developments in Europe, notably the EU Network and Information Security Directive. Um, and I was going to take a look around. Are folks in the room familiar with the NIS Directive generally? A little bit? Okay. I assume you're more familiar with the EU General Data Protection Regulation. But we're going to spend some time talking about that. And our goal here is you know, really to focus on what these policy developments mean for your business. Um, CA is a global company, obviously. And we are focused on regulatory and policy issues all over the globe that impact our business and impact our customers' business. And it, you know, suffice to say, there is, oh, sorry, this is the normal standard slide. Um, but uh, what we want to try to focus on today is obviously take a look at some of the um, more recent cyber and data protection policies in the U.S. and Europe. I want to talk a little bit about them and what's happening to move those forward to implementation, which, you know, obviously once legislation passes, we've got some implementation periods, which is when all of us in industry have to start taking these statutes and implementing them inside of our own business environments. Then we want to talk a little bit about how aligned the U.S. and EU approaches are. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about some other recommendations for CIOs and CISOs here, as well as some of the other things that we think are going to be happening um, in the field in the next handful of years. So um, it, it's not any, any earth-shattering observation to folks in the room that cyber and data privacy policies are top of mind for every government around the world. Um, you know, what we're seeing in terms of uh, a range of policies center around notions of what the balance should be between a regulatory approach to dictating how organizations should manage their cybersecurity posture or whether to set guide rails that can help incentivize organizations to up-level their cyber and data privacy practices. And so I won't go through all of these here, but these are the types of themes that we're seeing in the areas of focus around the globe. And specifically, you know, these are, this is an example of some of the issues that my team is working on around the globe. And in every geography in the world, virtually every country in which CA operates and every country in which you operate is moving forward and taking a look at what their cyber regimes and their data privacy regimes look like. Um, you know, it's not just the, the, the attacks that are driving those conversations, but as you've heard from CA and as you've heard from our CEO and our executives in, in, in their keynote conversations, you know, as everything moves digital, trust and building trust and establishing trust between you and your company and the consumers that you're interacting with is paramount. So um, 
what we want to do today is you know, have some conversations in particular about a couple of issues that have really been driving the debate on both sides of the Atlantic. And so the three areas of focus, as I mentioned, that we really want to spend most of our time on is uh, around uh, the NIST cyber framework in the United States, and we want to spend a little bit of time talking about the NIS directive in Europe as well as the GDPR. Um, so Adam, you, you know, maybe I'll start with you and I can kick it over. I'd love to just kind of have you help the audience understand where the framework came from, how we got to the point in the U.S. where the framework was the path that the U.S. government chose to pursue. And if you can, give us an overarching sense of what that means to companies and how they can adopt that in terms of their own internal cyber practices. Sure, and uh, thanks again for having me today. Um, so the cybersecurity framework is something that we've been working on at NIST since around 2013. Uh, so folks understand what NIST is. Uh, we are part of the federal government. We're a national laboratory within the Department of Commerce. Uh, we're the only national laboratory that's focused on industry's needs and our work in cybersecurity around standards and guidelines. A lot of our work goes to developing standards and guidelines for federal information systems. That's really what people know as far as, as along with our work in uh, cryptography that goes back uh, more than 40 years now. Um, with the cybersecurity framework, it actually came after a pretty lengthy debate, policy debate around how do we improve cybersecurity practices in critical infrastructure. Critical infrastructure is a term of art, and what it uh, largely means is there is a um, there are systems and assets and companies that um, uh, the, U the U.S. government is dependent on for national and economic security, but it doesn't regulate them. Um, and so it's really about around building private partnerships with those organizations, or it doesn't regulate all of them. Right. Um, and understanding that there is a back and forth here and understanding those dependencies, um, because uh, even though they're not government systems, and we don't oversee them in a way we do in, in a regulatory perspective, we need to work together to, um, uh, for, the, for the health and security of the American people. Um, back in 2013, and probably still today, um, policymakers were concerned that a lot of these companies within critical infrastructure might, may, might not be doing enough for cybersecurity, and they began with an approach that was, uh, by and large, regulatory. So there was a debate on Capitol Hill, as, as Brendan mentioned, I was part of it. And at the time, the consideration was, what if we gave some, maybe there is a market failure here, and maybe we need to remedy that market failure by having some regulatory authority for those most critical of critical infrastructure. Um, industry opposed it uh, quite strongly. And, um, it was probably too many unknowns. It was, we'll figure out who's regulated and we'll figure out how to regulate them later on. Um, and in the wake of that, I think a lot of folks in industry said, there are voluntary approaches that can complement regulated sectors. Why don't we look there? And they came to NIST to really serve as a convener for industry. Um, we joke at NIST that our greatest authority is that we have no authority. Um, we can't force anyone to do anything, so um, that really pressures us to have people come and work with us in a collaborative portion. That's not to say that um, we don't uh, engage with the regulators. Uh, a big piece of that relationship is with them as well because they have this really important responsibility in ensuring that those markets work. Um, so the cybersecurity framework was developed over the course of 2013. Um, it is out in the marketplace now. Um, Companies are using it. Some regulators are pointing to that in different ways. We can talk about that in the yeah. Q&A. Um, but by and large, it is a uh, easy to use guide for any organization in critical infrastructure out to build or improve their cybersecurity program. And I think the key thing for this topic is it is all based on international standards. So um, we developed this in a way not to compete with those international standards but really help organizations understand what those resources were and help them build those strong cybersecurity programs that could scale globally. Okay. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, no, appreciate it. So, um, so the, the framework's been out for a couple of years now. Um, 
What are you seeing in terms of uptake and, and how is the government looking at how industry has responded to the challenge of taking this and implementing it in their own business environments? Um, you know, I think one of the things that a lot of companies are thinking and seeing is, and, and I'd love to get your perspective on this as well, is you know, the framework's voluntary. Will it remain voluntary? And what does that mean in terms of long-term cyber risk management for U.S.-based companies as they're moving ahead? Sure. Um, so uh, what we've seen in terms of general uptake is um, we've been pleased with the general uptake. So we, um, because, this, because this is a voluntary process, um, we don't have... Uh, we don't go out and survey companies because that bit by bit would make it less and less voluntary if we go and say the voluntary thing that we asked you voluntarily to use would like you to voluntarily report to us. Right. Um, but we do track in terms of industry surveys. We do quite a bit of engagement. We have workshops that are still well attended. Um, our last workshop earlier this year had more people than any workshop on any topic that NIST has ever hosted. Um, and then we, you know, we monitor the media Gartner had some interesting t statistics where they said because it has been used by the auditing and the accounting community, so uh, PricewaterhouseCooper and Deloitte yep. have built it into the way they do cybersecurity assessments, they actually view that the use in the marketplace is hovering around 30% and could get up to around 50% in the next few years. Okay. Um, we know of very large prominent companies that are just, they're not just using the framework, they're also putting it through their supply chain. Yep. CA is one of them. Yep. Um, Microsoft, Apple, Intel, Bank of America, um, Exelon, they're all companies that we know are leveraging them as well as smaller ones. Mm -hmm. um, the regulatory, regulatory question has been really interesting because as we started this process, regulatory concerns were, were high up there, particularly coming out of that policy debate. Um, we're having a very different conversation with our stakeholders and with the regulators today. Some of that is driven by Congress. They passed a law, uh, the Cybersecurity Enhancement Act, that asked us to work directly with regulators to make sure that we weren't taking too much of a sector by sector approach. Right. Um, and that for organizations, we wanted to, they wanted us to work to help minimize any sort of compliance burden. So when we reach out to our stakeholders periodically and we ask them what are the things we should be focusing on, um, the top two right now are please work with the regulators so they understand this resource that we, we worked with you to develop. And the second one is work internationally to understand how this can scale out there. So when we work with our um, industry partners, they are still concerned about regulatory action but the request of us is to work with the regulators to the extent that they are creating regulation, if they can use the terminology that we agreed to in the framework, then that would help them reduce the burden. You know, I think we think generally that's an approach that makes sense. The regulators are gonna know more about their sectors, about their types of companies than we will. And so if there are things they choose to e emphasize based on what they've learned, that makes sense. It would also make sense to not create new structures, new frameworks, new languages, uh, when we have one that has a pretty broad base of support right now. Right, okay. So Andrea, across the Atlantic, uh, there's been a bit different approach, obviously, both as it relates to cybersecurity and in the data privacy space. Um, both uh, uh, the NIS Directive and the GDPR obviously take a, a bit more direct regulatory approach. Can you tell us a little bit kind of about how the commission uh, thought about these issues and give the folks in the audience a sense of what this means in terms of their operations in Europe in particular when it comes to security and data privacy. Absolutely. And uh, first of all, thank you for having me here and uh, trying to present a little bit of the European perspective uh, to the audience here, to the, to the to people who are interested in that. Uh, I, I have to, with respect, I have to question a little bit the premise of the question uh, in the sense that I know that there is this notion, which is very widespread in the U.S., uh, that Europe is super regulatory and uh, you know, we, we basically regulate the way we breathe, and <laughs> the way that people go to the toilet, etc. Uh, it's true, by the way, but... <laughs> uh, and uh, well, in the U.S., it's all of a hands-off approach and all left to self-regulation. I think the reality 
is a lot more mixed than this. And as a matter of fact, in Europe, before we arrived at the two pieces of legislation that were mentioned, the Network and Information Security Directive, or NIS Directive, and the upgrade of the previous data protection legislation we had, and we now had this new General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, but especially in the cybersecurity field, what, what folks should keep in mind is that before we arrived at that legislative instrument, that regulatory instrument, we had plenty of discussions within Europe, with our member states, with industry, with all the stakeholders, on which kind of best practices could we put in place, could the industry adopt, in a process that I would say, of course, it, led, it might have led to slightly different results, but in terms of process was very similar to what NIST has done with the framework. And since at least, as far as I remember, I joined the commission in 2007, and more or less at the time, we had already started to put in place, with the help of some specialized agencies, such as ENISA, the European Network and Information Security Agency, guidelines on risk management and on other issues. So that, that's the first thing to keep in mind. We didn't rush to legislation or regulation immediately. However, and because we went through this kind of a core self-regulatory approach with stakeholders, uh, we realized, and importantly, and this has to be kept in mind, that our member states and our own industry at a certain point told us, look, there are certain issues on which we need to have a baseline and that baseline has to be clear in regulation because otherwise you will have arbitrage between different member states, you will, have, you will not have a level playing field between industries that for historical reasons had already been regulated, such as the, at least in Europe, such as the telecommunications sector, and other industries such as the online services sector or internet services sector, which were not regulated. And this created a, a discrepancy for companies that were in fact providing almost the same service but were regulated in very different ways, uh, both when it comes to cybersecurity and uh, uh, to privacy. And so we came uh, after a, a long debate as, you know, democracy is what it is, is the worst possible system that we have except all others, and democracy is long, it's complicated, so it took us a bit of time to get to, when we talk about cybersecurity, to this piece of legislation, it's a directive, I don't want to bore you with the legal details, but one point that is important to keep in mind is that when I use the term directive, it's with a capital D, it's a specific legal term under European Union law, and it's a piece of union legislation that each member state has to implement, has to transpose within a specified time frame. And we came up with this directive, the NIS directive, uh, which, to cut a very long story short, basically imposes a, a few baseline requirements all across the union, uh, both for member states, so for public authorities, and for the industry. One of these requirements, and this is really for our member states, so it's not for the industry, it's for our own national governments, that every member state of the EU has to have a certain minimum baseline of uh, cybersecurity capabilities. Now, this might seem uh, perhaps bizarre, to put in legislation uh, for a country such as the US, you're a federal system, the European Union is not, strictly speaking, a federal system, but in the Union we had, and some might say we still have to a certain extent, uh, member states which have uh, a long tradition and very high capabilities that have invested a lot uh, into cybersecurity for strategic reasons, and some others which, let's be very honest, are not at the level. And uh, in an environment in which we are interconnected, uh, not only because of the internet, but in the union we're also interconnected because we have a common market. And we have services that are provided all across the union uh, without customs control, uh, without borders control, etc. So you need to have that baseline uh, of more or less equal capabilities. So that's one requirement. The second requirement, and this is also for industry, that in certain sectors, uh, critical sectors, strategic sectors, uh, Companies which operate in those sectors and are larger than a certain threshold, again, I don't want to bore you with the detail, I'm happy to give them perhaps in the Q&A or afterwards, uh, have to ensure uh, uh, breach reporting uh, uh, processes. Basically, the concept, I mean, it, I, I guess you're all aware of that, uh, the notion is simply something happens, uh, you need to report it. You need to report it to your competent authority. And this is where perhaps in, the, in Europe uh, we are not that we, we don't believe that much uh, in the power of the market to address these specific cybersecurity issues because market-based solutions are predicated uh, on the notion that there is information symmetry, that everybody knows what's actually happening. But as we see time and again uh, when it comes to cybersecurity, there are a lot of incidents, there are a lot of attacks, there are a lot of breaches that are simply not known uh, or maybe two or three or four years afterwards you get to know them. So that's it. Sorry, that's the other obligation. And then there is a third obligation, which is about information sharing. Uh, 
here I would like to be very clear, you cannot really, we are very much aware that you cannot impose information sharing 100%. Because if people don't want to share information, you cannot really force them. However, we created with this directive, we created certain legal structure with clear rules on what needs to be shared, on what is purely voluntary, how the information that is shared will be handled. That has always been one of the main issues for both industry and our member states' public authorities. If I share information about an attack on my national infrastructure, who gets to know about it? And uh, which kind of assurances do we have that that information will not then go somewhere else where it shouldn't go? So with this directive, we basically try to put this basic requirements in place. Importantly, these are baselines. We're very happy if industry or member states go beyond these baselines. With this legislation, we simply said, look, this is the bare minimum that you need to do in order for the system to work. And when it comes to the GDPR, if you want me to spend a few words about that, basically uh, the GDPR or General Data Protection Regulation uh, is a piece of legislation. Uh, uh, unlike the previous legislation that I mentioned, the directive, this is a regulation. Again, this is a technical term under European Union law. A regulation with a capital R is immediately applicable across all the member states. It doesn't need to be transposed. And this is very important for industry, including you folks, I guess, because when you have a directive, unavoidably, you have small differences in implementation between member states. To a certain extent, we accept that because uh, you know, the economic, social, cultural, business condition in, in Sweden are different than in Greece or in Malta or in Cyprus, etc. So you need to leave a certain leeway to member states to adapt the law to their own specificities. There are other cases, uh, the counter side of that uh, is that as a business, uh, if you don't check what member states are doing in transposing this legislation, you can easily end up with rather different national implementation, which makes your life more complicated because then all at once you have to deal with 28, uh, we're still 28 for the time being, uh, 28 different regulatory approaches. Yep. So when it comes to privacy or personal data protection, in this case, we decided to propose a regulation which is immediately applicable across all the member states. It will enter into force, uh, and I suggest to all of you who operate, uh, which operate in Europe, uh, to write down this day, because it's going to be very important. Uh, on the 15th of May, 2018, uh, this new regulation is going to become enforceable. So you are going to become responsible if you don't process personal data of European citizens according to the rules in this regulation. Now, I can go a little bit more in detail, but perhaps we don't have uh, that much time. The only point I would make is that if you work in the compliance offices of your companies uh, or as in-house counsels or whatever, my opinion is that with very few exceptions, these new rules that we introduced with the regulation uh, when it comes to privacy, are not very different from the framework that we already had in Europe. We did introduce a few new obligations, including for breach reporting, also in the privacy field. And uh, perhaps you won't be happy to hear this, but uh, what we really change in the regulation is the enforcement mechanism, yeah. which is now going to become uh, a lot tougher than it was with the previous directive, uh, including in certain cases, uh, in certain really, you know, with really bad actors that willfully violate the privacy of European citizens repeatedly with very high fines that can get up to 4% of the global turnover of a company. That's quite a bit of money if you yeah. start to make the count. Well, and that's where most of the attention, I think, has been certainly on this side of the Atlantic, yep. of what it means to be compliant with the GDPR and what the risks are of non-compliance. But you know, I want to I push back a little bit on what you said um, because you know, there are substantive changes as well, independent, and they're, they're related obviously to potential financial penalties, but some of the, the new provisions in, in the new GDPR obviously deal with certain technical aspects as well as responsibilities of systems designers yep. to integrate certain types of engineering and design practices, some of which are not yet fully understood. So uh, under the GDPR, for example, there is a, a principle that, that systems that are collecting and processing personal information must incorporate privacy by design to limit the amount of information that is collected, to limit to whom it can be shared, and to implement controls. Um, What's your sense of, of how the guidance on how a business is going to take that objective language in a statute and translate it into what they need to do when they're building products and services to touch a customer's data? What should companies here expect in terms of how the commission is going to proceed with moving that forward? Sure. 
Uh, let, me, let me share a very few thoughts on this very fair pushback. I, I should have been more precise. Indeed, if you look at the text of the new legislation, there are changes. You're completely yeah. right. The privacy by design, uh, the privacy by default, uh, which is similar to the privacy by design, but it basically means uh, when you design a new product or service, uh, by default, uh, that product or service has to be very privacy protective, uh, and so on and so forth. What I meant, though, is that our previous legislation, which dates back to 1995, uh, so it was you know, 30, 40 years ago, a long time ago, uh, it's, it evolved uh, in terms of the actual application of that legislation through court cases, uh, through interpretation of our data protection authorities, which are our national enforcers of privacy law. And if you look at the evolution of this enforcement and implementation of the old rules, uh, notions such as privacy by design, privacy by default, had already somehow entered uh, into the into the calculus that these enforcement authorities would make when deciding, okay, this company has violated our rules, uh, technically has violated our rules, but has it made uh, a good faith effort uh, to actually abide by these rules? And one way in which you would make this assessment is, has this company designed its product and service, by the way, not only in the IT sector, in every sector, has it designed its product or service uh, in a way that that product or service uh, tried to protect people's privacy, etc. Now, uh, where we have to be very, very clear is that the regulation does not, is completely technology neutral. This is a very important point because we had extensive debates uh, throughout the preparatory and the negotiation process of this law, which by the way, lasted four years. It was the, people tell me, and I have no difficulty believing it, uh, it was the most lobbied piece of legislation yeah. in the European Union uh, for the past 20 years. Which also means that you know, when you hear some criticism today on this piece of legislation, I think some of those criticisms, not this, uh, yeah. you interpret this as a criticism, no. but some of the criticisms that you hear, especially with respect from this side of the ocean, uh, I think they're a bit unfair because there was a lot of time to intervene into the debate and the discussion and things were changed compared to our initial proposal if you compare our initial proposal and the final product. Now, what I think companies, whether they're US companies or European companies or Chinese companies, it doesn't matter because one element, uh, which again may, maybe will not make people in this room, in this space very happy, but you need to know that in the new rules uh, there is, uh, and it's the first, one of the first articles, uh, we consider that if you, not only if you are physically located in Europe or if you are legally located in Europe and not only if you use technical tools or technical devices in Europe, but also if you provide services to European citizens. If you do that, from our perspective, it doesn't matter whether you are located in the US, in China, etc. We consider that we have jurisdiction over you. And this is something that you have to keep in mind because this has always been a debate for non-European companies which basically said, we don't care because we are not located in Europe, so your rules don't apply. Now, what I think companies all across the world uh, that want, uh, whether they want or they don't want, but will be subject uh, to European uh, Union uh, to this new regulation, uh, this regulation was finally approved uh, in uh, 2000 and uh, in April this year, if I remember correctly. As I said, it will become fully enforceable in 2018. This two years period uh, is not there by mistake. It's there by design because we knew that it would take industry at least that amount of time to actually understand what they needed to do and very importantly to engage with the regulators in Europe to understand together, okay, privacy by design is great and privacy by default is great and by the way, I know many companies which like the notion of privacy by design and default, how do we do it? So what I would encourage companies, uh, especially in the US, but not only, is to actually engage. Don't wait until uh, May 2018 uh, and then discover that European regulators have come up with some implementing rules uh, for these provisions in the regulation that don't work for your particular sub-industry or for your particular product, etc. My job here in the US is also to put you guys in touch if you don't know them, <laughs> to put you in touch with the people in Europe who are designing uh, these implementing rules. Yep. Yeah. So um, I I'm curious to get both of your thoughts. Um, how aligned do you see the approaches, you know, t talking specifically around cybersecurity now, relative to the approach that, that's been taken via the NIST framework and what ultimately will be implemented through the NIS directive? How do you see alignment there? I mean, uh, uh, Andrea, you made the point, which is, is certainly one that's on the minds of most of our customers who are global companies and who irrespective of where they are based, are implementing and complying with statutes and requirements around the globe. 
And so, um, you know, the, the instrument from the directive, obviously, even if we have a significant baseline of requirements, changes may impact that company's operation. But more specifically, you know, not just within Europe, obviously, as we're, we're, we're operating internationally as well, looking for the common denominator so that we can help understand where we need to move to get to the spirit of most of these requirements to minimize the amount of specific implementation for a particular requirement in a particular jurisdiction is always important and is always something that's on the mind of us and on the minds of our customers. How do you all perceive you know, the, the relationship between the two approaches that have been taken thus far? And, and, and I guess secondary to that, do you see over time, if you believe that they're not uh, correctly aligned, do you think we'll see more convergence in terms of standards and international practices as it relates to cybersecurity longer term? So I'll open up to either of you, Adam, if you want to start. Sure. Um, I'm tempted to do a Washington thing and respond to your last question yeah. as well. <laughs> but I will just say, we, we have a lot of work going on, on in privacy engineering as well at NIST right. to, yes. to look at some of the, the technical questions on how do you really engineer systems that are privacy enhancing. Um, but on your, uh, your current question, um, I think um, the approaches are very similar. Um, it was interesting when the NIS directive was first announced, it was actually the same week that the executive order came out that right. um, rolled out the framework, and we saw a lot of those similarities. I think um, in some ways it's still a little too soon to tell. I think the directive takes a perspective on risk management that's very similar to some of the objectives that we have, I think policymakers like everyone else, like concepts of risk management because they see the flexibility <clears throat> and it's dynamic. And if you have a good sense of an organization's risk management practices, you have a good sense that they are prepared for whatever will come their way. That's why people like them. Um, so at the highest level, a lot of those concepts are there in the directive. I think the rubber's gonna hit the road when the member states start implementing. So I think um, there's a lot of good work that could be done there. Uh, you have the Italian National Cyber Framework. Um, that's something that uh, takes the, some of the concepts that are in the cybersecurity framework as its base. And um, uh, a group of computer science professors across Italy took it, worked with industry partners, and made it more relevant for that country. They have many more small businesses, so they put some emphasis on some different controls. Um, and I think that's a good model, and hopefully things we, we can work with with other countries. And we certainly do engage with those other countries quite a bit. The other opportunity we have now is that the framework itself is not a static document. So um, in the next uh, two months, we're going to release a uh, updated draft of the next version for comment. So I think it's a good opportunity to work with the member states to say, as you're implementing this NIS directive, um, we have this resource that was developed with a group of stakeholders that included people who do business in your country, included your companies. Uh, we'd like to invite you and, and your companies to come participate with us, and hopefully this will become a resource that is meaningful to you as you need to implement this directive. That is my hope. Um, I think now is really the time to do that work, but... Um, yeah. Andrea, your thoughts? Look, I, I think as, as, as it has been said that we all agree, first of all, and this is important because it was not obvious until recent, until not that long ago, we all agree that there is a potential issue that requires intervention. Now, whether that, inter that intervention is purely industry-led uh, or is co-regulatory, part industry and part government, or is purely regulatory, that's a debate uh, that we can have. As I said, I think that sometimes there are a bit of misunderstandings on the approach that is taken here, either in the US or in Europe. So we agree on that. We, in my view, in my experience, and when I was back in Brussels, indeed, I, I used to work a lot on cybersecurity, so certainly until I was sent here to the US, uh, I always felt that there is also, uh, there was, and I hope there still is, quite a bit of agreement uh, on uh, the procedures, on what constitutes the risk, on what are the, what are the appropriate control measures that you can put in place. Uh, now, you know, politics being what it is, sometimes uh, it's necessary to call the same thing in two different ways so that your stakeholders and your constituents are happy. But in reality, I never saw a major difference uh, in, in practical terms between the two frameworks. Having said all of this, so I'm, I must say I'm optimistic from this point of view. I think there is a lot of willingness on both sides of the Atlantic, both at the governmental and at the industry level, especially at the industry level, because again, nobody wants to have to deal with slightly different approaches to the same issues, and that's very clear. 
So I'm optimistic, but I also think that it's important to be realistic. And what I mean by this is that there has been, a, a, at a certain point in time, there has been a, a tendency, I believe, not by NIST, to be absolutely clear, but by some other agencies in the US to basically almost, in a quote unquote, but almost impose a certain regulatory approach that just wouldn't work in Europe for many different reasons. And likewise, our regulatory approach in Europe or the way in which we address these issues in Europe will not necessarily work here in the US. So harmonization, regulatory harmonization, which some people sometimes dream of, is we should forget about it. It's not going to work not in the next 20, 30, 50 years. What we should aim at is interoperability between our systems. And there are different ways, whether it's in the field of cybersecurity or privacy or everywhere else or anywhere else, we, we know how to do that. There are different ways in which you can address that. You can do that through regulatory, basically saying, look, yes, the controls that we use or the requirements that we impose to operate, for example, in the financial sector, if you design an IT system for the financial sectors in Europe as opposed to the US, are slightly different. The procedures that you follow in order to assess compliance are slightly different. But ideally, you get to a point in which if you are certified as compliant in Europe, then by default, you're also certified as compliant in the US and vice versa, which is a lot of work that we usually do also in trade trade negotiations, it's the regulatory component of trade negotiation. So we can, and in my personal view, we should do that, we should address that. Where I think that people need, as I said, to be very realistic, uh, is in not dreaming of a regulatory, uh, or regulatory approximation or regulatory co full coherence between the two systems, which is not going to happen anytime soon. And the last point, uh, I think that, look, I've been in the, in the European Commission almost 10 years, in government almost 10 years. Before that, I was in the private sector. And I think that in many of these debates, uh, what's often missing uh, is the voice, uh, not so much of the big players, because we hear a lot about the big companies, whether they are in the US or in Europe or elsewhere, but it's the voice of the small and medium businesses, because those are the ones that actually are going to be most severely impacted uh, by not very well thought out <laughs> regulatory approaches. A very big business has the resources to deal with the jurisdictional differences and regulatory divergent approaches. A small business has, it's much more difficult for it to deal with this. So the voice of these small businesses, uh, again, politics being what it is, uh, if you don't, and I don't use the term in a bad way, I think it's a completely normal thing to do in democracies, if you don't lobby, if you don't make it clear, speaking for the European Commission to the European Commission, look, if you do this, uh, then there is going to be a problem for small businesses in the US, which to be completely honest with you is not our main concern. We're not paid to, cons to worry about be. businesses in the US, <laughs> but it's going to be a problem also for businesses in Europe uh, to the extent that they use businesses in the US for a lot of processing and outsourcing, <laughs> etc. So my, my message here would be if you don't talk, we are willing to listen, but if you don't talk, we cannot understand what the issue is. Now, Adam, and, and that's a great point, Andre, and it reinforces some of what you know, NIST did, I think that has been part of the reason why the, the framework has been a success in the US thus far. And you know, when the framework came out, you and your colleagues did a lot of sectoral and yep. national and international outreach on what the framework was, how an organization could take it and use it, and how you see it evolving in terms of an organization's continually evolving cyber um, uh, ecosystem and posture. What, uh, you know, what are you thinking, are you thinking of anything different in terms of how, when, when you're releasing the new, new iteration of the framework with some, some changes and some additional comments, are there additional stakeholder outreach activities that you're thinking about, and, and I guess, the reason I ask that is because in, you alluded to this a little bit um, in, in the beginning of the conversation is, you know, you're, you're seeing some uptake. Uh, are, are you seeing enough? What else do you think needs to be done to continue to push this vision of where an organization can move when it comes to cyber via the framework? And how is the government thinking about how they're going to adapt that to take the message of what the framework is to the next 40% of companies? that haven't yet implemented it, but certainly can gain value from it, irrespective of whether, and I think one of the things that's important for folks in the room is, and one of the, one of the things that US industry in particular, I think is really appreciated about how the framework was structured is that it recognizes that no one's 
individual threat environments are, are, are they're, they're, no ones are identical. Everyone has unique risks, you have unique technologies, unique business processes, and the value of the framework, you know, certainly one of them from our perspective has been that it establishes a repeatable way for thinking about things that as your threat um, landscape evolves, you can continue to adjust. So, um, Adam, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so, I th yeah, I think you're right. I think what we were able to do with the framework is <clears throat> recommend a process. And what we've been working on over the last couple of years, I mean, I think the way I roughly think about it is it, it took us a year to develop it, a year to promote it, right. um, and then we spent a year um, developing these, uh, working with industry to develop these sector guides. And over the course of the last year, we've actually developed a lot of material in-house that we put out for comment. And a lot of this is working with not only different types of sectors, but different audiences, right? So um, we have folks at NIST that hadn't done a lot in cybersecurity, but they do a lot of quality management. So we worked with them to develop a guide for, um, it's called a Baldridge Performance Excellence Guide for Cybersecurity, that helps uh, an organization that's thinking about their overall organizational goals asks them some forward-leaning questions about, okay, what are your real dependencies and how do you build a cybersecurity program as a part of that, leveraging some of the guidelines in the framework. The other thing that I think has happened is in 2013, there was like a laser focus on critical infrastructure. The scenario that the policymakers kept on talking about was, what if a hacker could take down the grid remotely? Um, in 2016, we've lived through Target and Sony <coughs> and Home Depot, you name it, it's become much more of a consumer issue and much more of an issue that focuses beyond just critical infrastructure. And as a result, a lot of our engagement and a lot of the companies we work with go well outside of critical infrastructure. And the small medium, small medium business is another piece of it because even if they're not directly impacted, they are increasingly being impacted by regulation because it's it's the companies they're doing business with that are regulated. Right. Financial sectors are, uh, increasingly are saying, what are you doing from a vendor management perspective, which leads to new sets of questionnaires that go out to the small or medium businesses that might serve those companies, or, or the big ones. Well, uh, no, <laughs> and, and we get those questions yeah. and questionnaires all the time as part of our contract discussions with your companies and other companies right. who are pushing that further down in their supply chain. I guess, you know, so apart from you know, the fact that you, you've identified maybe, you know, a 30% range right. of companies that you've been talking to have been implementing this. Are you seeing that flow down effect have the intended effect in the marketplace, which, you know, legitimately is, you know, CA's adopted it. We're yeah. implementing it through our supply chain as well. How are you measuring that? And are you seeing a collective lift in terms of understanding and management of cyber challenges just by virtue of the network effect, if yeah. you will, as, as we're moving out. So that's something we intend to evaluate as we go through this process right now. Um, we have these rough statistics. Right. Uh, we look at sector engagement. We look at the sort of things we're, we're involved in. A lot of it is <laughs> figuring out not just um, where to go, but also where is it appropriate, appropriate for us to be, even be in the room to have those conversations to the extent that this is a foundation for business-to-business -business conversations, then having a government guy in the room is often a distraction or yeah. not helpful. Yeah. Um, so we certainly are seeing, we've seen it gone in interesting places. We increasingly get questions from policymakers like that one. How do you have a sense of the overall impact? Um, it's a very difficult one to answer and evaluate. Yeah. But um, what I would like to see is figure out, working with industry is figuring out what are the evaluations that they would like to see, right? So I think if, if NIST worked with the Department of Homeland Security and spent $10 million coming up with this great evaluation and we released it out, I think a lot of people in industry would look at it and say, yeah, I don't know if I believe that. Right. So, um, but I do get a lot of questions from industry because when they go and they brief their board and say, this is why this is important, a lot of times their boards are asking them, well, what are other people doing? Exactly. I, why should I use this thing? And what are other companies doing? Companies are still very reluctant to share this information. Often they believe yeah. that it puts a target on their back. So even things like this work we've done in quality management is to try to grow a, a resource where companies and businesses and all sorts of organizations can begin to share those sorts of practices more robustly. 
without, stand, without thinking that they're standing up and saying, um, you know, I'm unhackable, which right. no one would be, um, but get those resources out there, lower the temperature, and then it would help us do that, uh, figure out how to evaluate use and where we need to head next. Okay. Andrea, we've only got a few seconds left, but I want to just kind of ask a, a very sharp question, which is um, for companies and organizations in the room, um, particularly as it relates to GDPR, how do you recommend they start? Um, the, you know, the, this is a huge undertaking. CA is going through this process internally. Uh, we're also talking to a lot of you as you're beginning to think about how you start to scope what you need to do to make sure that you're up to speed when mid-2018 comes up. Anything in just a handful of seconds that you can recommend to the team here? I think that the most important thing is that you start. Yeah. And uh, time is short uh, and uh, don't underestimate the amount of work it will take and don't underestimate the willingness of European regulators and enforcers to go after even small companies about this. I don't want to scare anybody, but this has become politically very important. And the second, perhaps a little bit more constructive, uh, thing that I will say, a recommendation I will give, I think you need to see this as an opportunity and not as a cost. Because the reality is that nowadays, a lot of companies, whether they're small, big, or whether they are specific IT companies, or companies in other fields which use IT as part of their procedures, you are all, we are all collecting huge amounts of data all the time. And what's happening is that most of the time we have no idea where the data is. We have no idea what are the internal processes in our organizations. And this means that you are not, as a company, you're not actually able to use that data in the best possible way for your organization. You're not able to monetize the data, which is perfectly possible under European law, in the best possible way. So especially if you need to sell this, let's be very realistic, if you need to sell compliance cost to your board, uh, my suggestion would be explain to your board that by doing this, you're going to become a more efficient organization. And as a nice side effect, you're also going to avoid the European regulators coming after you. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me, we're going to have to stop there. We're out of time. Uh, we'll be ha over here, happy to have any side conversations with anybody if you'd like to. But Andrea and Adam, thanks so very Thank much you. for joining thanks, us. Yeah. And I hope the conversation was useful. Thank you.